and the title of my talk there, Resilience, Biodiversity, Mining and Human Well-Being. So some of you may be wondering, well, how do, how do all these things connect together? And um, I'm going to try and argue today that they, they, they do connect together. And um, this is the, the, the way I'm going to present my case or my argument. I'll start off by presenting the biodiversity crisis, which is getting worse. And it's, it's in this era of escalating global change. Um, I'll be talking about the role of mining and biodiversity hotspots. And I'll be then move on to managing for biodiversity and human well-being in mining regions using a resilience framework. So I should add that I don't come from a mining background, but I have developed, managed, and researched community-based conservation and tourism projects that were associated with and funded by mining companies and mining developments in South Africa. And towards the end of my talk, I'll draw from those experiences to, to give examples of how I think all these things can link together. And uh, so the worsening biodiversity crisis, uh, the United Nations Convention on Biodiversity, which some of you may have heard of, um, first agreed upon in 1992 in the, in the Rio summit there. Um, it aimed to substantially reduce rates of biodiversity lost by 2010. It's one of the most widely ratified treaties on the planet. Um, and when 2010 came along, there were many reviews of, well, how have we done against meeting this, this target? And we're not doing very well. Um, biodiversity, we, we, there's no evidence that we've reduced the rate of biodiversity loss. Um, I was talking to, to Mark Hawkins from the, uh, the, the Geography Department, and um, he works quite a lot with the IUCN, the World Conservation Union, and he said, well, what probably is happening is that the rate of increase of loss is decreasing a little, but um, we, haven't, we haven't seen actually that, that the, the rate of loss itself is decreasing. Um, so so we're, not, we're not doing very well on that. And this uh, continued loss of biodiversity is taking place um, amidst escalating global change and connectivity, so issues like climate change, invasive species, land use change, which, which many of you would have heard of, that's, that's, that's all ongoing. And, um, but when we talk about global change, it's, it's not only environmental change, like climate change we're interested in, it's also about other drivers of, of socioeconomic change. Um, and, and, and these, these, these interactions between these socio-economic drivers, such as rapid economic growth in emerging economies, globalization and growing inequity across the world, um, which, which is, is, is a big and growing issue, um, and the interactions with these drivers and the, the drivers of environmental change are important. Um, so obviously one of the key socio-economic drivers that, that's Part, of, part of, of, of what global change is bringing is the continued levels of increasing wealth in low and middle income countries. And this will continue to lead for growing demand for minerals and energy resources. Now, um, the ongoing financial crisis and global recession may reduce the growth for this demand for the next few years, but the longer term projections for the growth of the demand for these minerals and, and energy resources um, suggest that for example, we're looking at a doubling, well, nearly a doubling in the demand for copper by 2030. Um, fossil fuel consumption is projected to increase by 39% by 2030. Um, so what this means is that mining is going to expand into more and more remote areas. And Papua New Guinea, for example, which uh, I had the fortune to visit last year and where, where these images from is, I think, a good example of, of what's happening. Does anyone here work in Papua New Guinea or, okay, but you, you probably have some good insight as to, as to, as to some of my ideas around what, what I saw happening there. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful place. It's home to a large number of birds, mammals and ecosystems found nowhere else on the planet. There is extensive oil, gas, and other mining developments taking place there. Um, Papua New Guinea has a low governance capacity, and in the areas that I was traveling around in, and I was there to, to set up um, tourism, especially bird watching tourism, um, mining companies are clearly, they represent the most powerful de facto force on the ground in, in the many parts of the country I visited. If you see what's happening there, why is this happening? Why is this road being built? Why is this being built? Uh, mining, the mines. So these large, or large multinational mining companies, 
some of which are present in Papua New Guinea, have committed themselves to environmental and social responsibility. So, as, as you in this audience I'm sure know, Rio Tinto, for example, we seek to understand the social, environmental and economic implications of activities, so we can optimize benefits, reduce negative impacts. Um, we want to minimize, mitigate and remediate harmful effects of the group's, group's operations on the environment. And if you look at PHP Bulletin, um, Newmont, Alcoa, which is, which is mentioned quite widely in conservation science circles as a, as, a, as a responsible mining company, they've all got a similar commitment to environmental responsibility um, and social responsibility. Um, there's, there's, for example, in the projects I worked on in South Africa, there's a lot of talk of net positive benefit. If we're going to build a mine in your area, in 30 years' time, we want to see net positive benefit for the environment and society. So, obviously, there's a link between um, what we want to achieve as conservation scientists or the conservation movement and what these big mining corporations say they want to achieve as well as part of, as part of their, their um, mining operations. So, um, I'm going to, to talk a little bit about how I can see that link working. Um, and, and, but some of you may think, well, this is a little naive because there's, there's a lot of issues in, in, in linking biodiversity, conservation, biodiversity, and mining. And um, so just before I get on to onto how I think some of these things could connect, I'm just going to talk a little bit about those challenges. Now, I'm aware that there is a high level of resentment and antagonism that exists between conservation scientists and the mining sector. So, for example, conservationists, and this is a term that, that I don't know if they use it here in Australia as well, it's used in South Africa a lot, they accuse miners of catnap. Is that a term you use here? Cheapest available technology, narrowly avoiding prosecution. Um, claim that mining corporations abuse their power, they've got more power than, than other segments of society and they think they can just do what they want to. Um, there's no regard for social and environmental concerns beyond lip service. They might say on paper, we're interested in these outcomes, but if you look at what they do, no, they clearly their actions suggest that they're not. Um, some of the, the mining companies, and I've interacted less with them, but, uh, but, but some of, some of the, the things I've read and heard people say, they see the conservation movement as fun, sometimes as fundamentalist greenies with an anti-development and anti-progress ideology. Now, I don't think, and this is talking particularly from the conservation science side and the conservation movement side, that a sort of viewing the, the mining sector as the enemy is, is a useful way to, to start. Um, I think there, there are cases when, when mining developments really should be regulated more or should be done differently, but um, I think to view them as, as, as blanket bad and as something that should be stopped, I don't think is going to get us very far. Um, and and what I think is ultimately needed is trust and agreement on a core set of shared values. And, and that takes time to develop, and um, some people might argue, well, that's, that's impossible. I don't think it's impossible, for example, um, River catchments in South Africa, where the headwaters of rivers start up in the highlands and flow into national parks. 20, 30 years ago, people, the conservation movements and the irrigate, irrigators were in conflict. And now, through various social processes and, and quite a long time, five to ten years, they've actually got to the point where they've developed a core set of shared values. And what we're seeing now is that the irrigating or the, the, the irrigation farmers are releasing more water than is legally required because they've got a set of shared values with the conservationists about maintaining the health of the rivers that flow through the national parks. So it is possible. And part of this is realization by both sides that they can only get what they want if the other side also get what they want. So um, I think a resilience thinking framework can help us think creatively about how we could, could develop and, and, and foster this link between mining development and biodiversity and, and human livelihoods. And um, so why do I say that? Why do I think that resilience thinking is useful for this? Um, it's, resilience thinking takes an interactive social ecological systems perspective. And when I say social ecological systems, I mean interacting systems of humans and nature. It's not viewing it, 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 it inherently when one takes a resilience lens on a system, you're seeing, well, the social system and the ecological system are in a constant flow of interaction. And if you want to achieve outcomes in either part of the system or for the system as a whole, you've got to understand those feedbacks and interactions. 
It acknowledges and incorporates alternative value systems, worldviews, knowledge systems, and objectives. And I think that's important. A lot of conservation science is, okay, we've got these species here, that's almost sacrosanct, how do we conserve them? Which sort of conservation plan do we need so we maximize the number of species we conserve? Um, if, you, if you come at, at, at a conservation problem more from a resilience thinking perspective and the sets of tools around that, you'd be, well, yes, that's one way of viewing the system, but there are other ways of viewing the system. Other people may see other values um, rooted in other mental models or worldviews, and one needs to incorporate those. To, to manage and to understand social ecological systems. And in this, it enables a visioning of and a managing towards shared outcomes. So just briefly, what is, what is resilience? Um, if I'm using the word, it's essentially the ability of a system to deliver a defined set of services and outcomes in the face of disturbance and change. And there's a, um, a paper that's just out in annual reviews on, on a, a review of, of the, the uh, principles that enhance the resilience of ecosystem services. So if people are more interested in this concept and reading that, that literature, I think that paper captures the most recent work on it. I can, I can send that through. So just an example to explain resilience a little more, my PhD work, coral reef tourism. Um, Essentially, within this, I looked at the resilience of the coral reef tourism sector to climate change and crises in, in Thailand and in Australia. And it's, it's a resilient coral reef tourism system is a system that's able to maintain its identity as a region with a healthy and diverse reef system that maintains or grows an extensive coral reef tourism industry through crises and change. So, um, here's a, a visualization. Of, of how you could visualize resilience. And so resilience, the resilience literature talks a lot about these basins of attraction. Um, and essentially, so if you could imagine the basin of attraction on the right is a desirable basin of attraction. It's one in which in the reef tourism context, you have healthy reefs, you've got a healthy reef tourism sector providing lots of jobs and lots of income to the community. Um, that's separated by a threshold, the dashed red line, where you get into the other basin where the reef, quality, reef condition is declining rapidly and uh, income to communities is dropping and the economy is not in a very good position. So, so from a resilience perspective, we're interested in what the factors are that enable reef tourism to remain within the desired state and basin of attraction and not cross that threshold into an undesirable state. And unlike concepts of maximum sustainable yield and, and optimal um, allocation of resources for conservation and environmental management, resilience thinking says, well, it doesn't matter that much where you are in that basin of attraction. What you want to do is avoid going into where you do not want to be. And to try and tell yourself that you can know exactly where you want to be in the system, you're probably bluffing yourself because you won't know because there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, so how... Do I think this 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 may this concept and way of thinking may be useful for say mining development? So again, getting back to New Guinea, and, and New Guinea I think is, is a somewhat extreme example, but there's many other regions of the world like that. It's got poor local governance capacity. It's got high levels of biodiversity, high levels of poverty, and um, a large mining development represents a transformative change in the system. So when I was in New Guinea last year, this is one of the landscapes I visited. This is near Tari in the Southern Highlands. And just near the site, a new runway was being constructed. And the people I spoke to there told me it's going to be capable of landing Boeing 747 cargo planes. That's going to, they're going to fly straight in, in from, from international locations. And the sole purpose of this is to support a new mining development that's going in. And so... Um, Speaking to some, some, some guys, some Australians and, and, and Brits from, uh, from, from that construction site, they got, they got chopped into to Ambua Lodge where I was staying just to have a few beers. And they told me, well, look, this is a 20, 30 year project that they're developing here. So a big, a big mining development in this sort of region, um, how, how may that play out? Um, what one sees in many parts of the world fortress mines with minimal local benefits, little concern for the, the, the responsible mining operation and continued degradation of the environment by local people. And with such a development, bringing in new technology 
um, some, some development of infrastructure, it, it, it actually makes it easier for, for local communities because they now have the means to actually degrade the environment there more quickly. Um, the mining companies in such a scenario, and one sees these scenarios play out in, 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 in quite a lot of the world, um, they do not achieve their social and respons environmental responsibility objective, which I highlighted earlier. And um, I think there's, in such cases, evidence that the local environment and community suffer rather than benefit in the long run from these developments. And uh, the mines may then be affected by social strife. You already see this in New Guinea and negative international press about, about their operations, which obviously doesn't, doesn't, doesn't do them any good if they want to go and mine elsewhere in other countries. So an alternative, more uh, positive scenario, a sustainably profitable mine, empowerment of local communities, and the conservation of key biodiversity sites in a mining region. So now, again, this was an example. You've got two potential places. Your your system could, could, could end up in. You could be in a desirable basin of attraction where you're getting these, uh, you're achieving profitability sustainably, you're achieving environmental benefits, you're achieving social benefits in the long run, or you could end up in a place where your, your mining operation might be profitable in the short term, but there's, there's lots of negative social impacts and associated social strife which affects your long-term sustainability and lots of negative impacts on the environment. So, um, how, does one, how does one think about that and are there processes for, for, for thinking about your system to get to that desirable basin of attraction? Now, South African National Parks, where I was working until I started my postdoc here at UQ in March, have actually institutionalized such a process for the development, assessment and implementation of management plans for national parks. And these things are captured, these processes are captured in documents like this. And essentially, the process looks something like this. This is an adaptation. Um, you start off by establishing a shared vision. So say around, for example, a mining region, you might be, OK, well, this is our shared vision within 30 years or 20 years of what we want our region to look like. As part of that, you explore the different values and perspectives of the different, the different stakeholders of the different parties. You explore the context. You set objectives. You prioritize and operationalize these objectives. Importantly, you then assess and modify those objectives against different scenarios. Um, so, do this in tourism. What if there's a slump in international tourism? How will these objectives be affected and how could you think differently about them? In mining, I imagine you'll have lots of similar issues, the price of the minerals, the price of the inputs, etc. You then go through to implement and monitor, evaluate and learn. And um, I think this, this process is, 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 is somewhat different from some existing processes in place in that it explicitly actually explores different stakeholder values and mental models and, and focuses on the development of that shared vision. The process also explicitly considers the different values and perspectives that mining companies, local communities and conservationists bring to the table. Um, uncertainty is being accounted for by assessing and modifying objectives against different scenarios. And there's also recognition of the importance of the continual iterations of monitoring, evaluation, learning, and adaptation. Now, those of you with experience in project management, or particularly development project management, will see a lot of similarities in terms of these processes. And it's in that link to, to development projects um, that I have, as I mentioned earlier in my talk, worked on projects where we've tried to link um, funding from mining corporations associated with mining expansion to biodiversity and livelihoods. And it's that, that part that I'll be moving on to in my talk now. So essentially, prior to starting my uh, PhD, I spent much of my time, and that was my PhD was at James Cook University, I spent much of my time developing, managing, and studying conservation and development projects with a birdwatching tourism emphasis in Southern Africa. Many of these projects were funded through a BirdLife International Rio Tinto partnership or through another project in South Africa funded by the Beers called the Diamond Birding Route. And the idea of these projects was to create awareness and livelihood benefits for local people around sites of conservation interest through birding tourism development. And community members would be trained and supported as local bird guides and as agents for conservation in their area and their community. 
and so some of the project sites that, that I worked on in South Africa, the projects in KwaZulu Natal in the inset there, um, they were all funded by the uh, Rio Tinto BirdLife International Partnership and they centered around Richards Bay um, in, on the northern KwaZulu Natal coast um, and associated with a subsidiary there called Richards Bay Minerals. Another key project um, was centered around Kimberley um, in sort of right in the center of center north of South Africa and uh, that was on a De Beers property and linked to, linked to, to De Beers operations and that later became part of the diamond birding route. And that diamond birding route was essentially De Beers saying, look, well, we, we've got all these, these properties, some of them associated with mines, some of them just properties. We essentially manage them as private nature reserves. We want communities to benefit from them. We want um, to build capacity and, and empower low-income communities and people through these properties. Now, for anyone who's um, worked on projects like this, they're full of challenges. Um, Community-based conservation and tourism projects are hard. I mean, uh, development projects, social development projects in low and middle income countries in transition are hard. One faces issues of differences in cultures, mental models, perspectives, and expectations. Um, there's a low level of capacity. Extensive resources are needed for capacity building. In the case of bird watching tourism, it's a specialist industry, so you need even more resources. In the South African context, there's a history of active disempowerment um, from the apartheid era, and that's still the inertia of that in the culture of some of the low-income communities is quite strong, and so you have to actively work against that. Poor infrastructure, um, for example, in some of these projects, the guides can't get quickly to the location where they have to meet their clients. Um, communities are in rapid transition, which leads to chaos and disruptions. You finally get to the point where you're getting a nice tour group coming through and you get a call that morning from the guy, oops, my father's just been shot. I'm sorry, I can't make it. Um, my uncle's just died of AIDS. Sorry, I've got to, I can't make it. And, and this, this is hard. Um, and then there's also the tall puppy syndrome, as it's called in Australia. Uh, when an individual becomes wealthy through entrepreneurship, the rest of the community actively um, don't like that and they resent that and that, has, that comes at a, at a large social cost. So there's some uh, evidence in the literature that that tendency is linked to resource scarcity, but it's a big issue. One of the projects I worked on on the border of uh, Namibia, Zambia, Botswana, and Zimbabwe, the local community actually told me that, well, look, if, if I go and work for this lodge owned by foreigners in Botswana, just across the border, and I get wealthy, and I buy a nice car and a nice house, that's fine. That's fine, but if I start my own business in my own community, and I get the same amount of wealth, that's a serious problem. So, so there's all these interesting uh, mental models around what it is to be an entrepreneur, what it is to, to become wealthier, um, and that, that interacts with the community settings in which, in which these projects operate. There's also weak or dysfunctional local institutions, and importantly, um, that some of the projects I worked on um, the donor funding of two to five years is way too short to actually sustainably ch change the trajectory of some of these communities and some of these systems. And um, so community-based projects, I'd say quite broadly, where you're trying to take a low-income community and transition and, and put them on a or try and facilitate towards a different trajectory, need to be linked to an institution with continuity. It can't just be a five-year intervention and then we walk away and it's going to work. It actually needs to be an institution that's going to be there for at least 10 to 15 years, preferably longer. And my research in, uh, in South Africa suggested that uh, if you've got 10 to 15 years on a site in some of these projects, you've probably got a 50% chance of, of changing the trajectory of that system onto a trajectory of greater levels of empowerment and wealth and, and some conservation outcomes. Um, now, this is linking back to, to mining. These sorts of companies with their, uh, their, their social and environmental responsibility objectives setting up projects like the one I described in New Guinea are institutions with continuity. These are long-term developments. These agencies, these corporations, they're going to be there. And um, so because of that, and be so because they'll be a, a force and, and, and they'll represent some sort of agency and power in those systems for quite some time, I think there's there's a good opportunity for them to actually enable and facilitate some of these changes. So, 
What are some of the research questions I think we need to achieve these synergies between mining, biodiversity and human livelihoods? Um, are there existing mining developments in critical biodiversity hotspots that represent opportunities for action? We need to develop measures and processes to gauge the presence of enabling social and institutional concepts to sensibly target resources and efforts. I'm um, talking to some people from the World Bank a few years ago at a meeting in South Africa. They were saying, well, look, we're now getting to the point where we're saying we do an institute, a rapid institutional assessment, and based on that, we say, well, we're not going to work there. It's probably our chances of success are clearly lower than they are in Site B, where the local institutions seem to be healthier. Um, evaluate tools and alternative models for partnerships between local, communi local communities, conservation agencies, and mining corporates. Um, this may include government departments and other elements of the private sector. So, for example, in South Africa, we've got uh, what used to be spatial development in initiatives, and a lot of it's around pro poor infrastructure development, possibly associated with a mine. Um, government would come in and say, okay, well, we'll build the highway, and you might have other private sector coming in and say, well, there's a nice nature reserve there, we'll build a lodge. And so those, those sorts of partnerships represent potential for change. And then collaborative assessments with mining companies to ensure that critical and sensitive biodiversity hotspots are preserved. So I think there are going to be cases where um, there are very unique habitats, very unique assemblages of species, and will be, well, really, if you build your mine on that mountain, or if you mine on that mountain, that's it. These things exist nowhere else. Rather do not mine there. Let's try and find a place where there's a... Uh, which is less of a biodiversity hotspot with a less unique assemblage where you can get a similar uh, type of, of mineral resource extraction. Um, this sort of research is very much non-traditional action research. It falls into the realm of post-normal post science where we're actively questioning the system, we're engaging with the system actively and doing our science. And, and one of the reasons that, that one, one, I think one has to take this approach is that developing these sorts of initiatives links between Mining, um, biodiversity, and human livelihoods is complex and difficult and requires continual learning and adaptation. You can't, in the traditional sort of blueprint development sense that, that came out in the 1950s, stand back and say, okay, we've got, we've got an objective picture of what works and what doesn't work. This is what we should do, and we should roll it out across 150 sites. That's not how this works. The context matters, and you have to be in the system doing science to actually understand it and inform it and, and learn and adapt over time. So, just to conclude, um, as, as, as you in this audience would know, and as the mining corporations certainly know, the cost of not adequately considering the issues of social in, in, and environmental responsibility can be really high. As anyone who's followed the recent violence in South Africa around the mines would know, these mines are losing millions to billions of, of rands or dollars. Um, they're having to shut down some of their operations, and certainly if um, my take on the situation is if they paid more attention to some of the issues around so so social responsibility in this case and the condition that their workers and their families were living in, they probably would have reduced the risk that these sorts of things would have, would have flared up as they did. Um, and I think that through a real commitment by mining companies to work, to work towards meaningful social and environmental benefits that stem from their operations, the risks of tragedies like the recent violence in South Africa can be minimized and mining, can, mining corporations can play a critical role in delivering benefits to society and the environment beyond the energy resources and minerals that they extract. Um, I'd just like to thank you for listening and thank a group of postdocs at, uh, at SEED, Natalie Butt, uh, Hawthorne Bayer and others that we've been working on some ideas of, 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 of the link between biodiversity and mining. Um, Harry Biggs, my father at South African National Parks, he gave me some, he's been working um, with negotiating with mines that are interested in, in mining in or around national parks for quite some time. He gave me some good insights in, for, for this talk. And University of Cape Town, where I did my research on these projects, BirdLife South Africa, who funded it, and the Center for Coral Reef Studies at the James Cook University, where I did my PhD. Thank you.